was this afternoon from four to five. And the other is on breaches and what you can do to, um, <laughs> sorry, I overdid your spelling error on there. I didn't realize I capital Z that will cause. Um, uh, Wakaz will be going over how to hack Salesforce and how to prevent your code from being hackable. So it, it's hopefully after this and, and during this session actually here, uh, Wakaz has agreed to give us a uh, code fail of the month session. So we may be leading into that here after another slide or two. But this is next month's uh, session all about uh, code security and better coding practices uh, mostly inside Apex, but it'll also cover JavaScript and LWC um, in the ongoing months. Uh, so, Wakaz, you want to take us through your slides? So oh, give us a you. brief introduction to who you are. I'm sorry I didn't do a great job of, of introducing you, but go ahead. Thank you, Paul, for having us. Uh, hello, everybody in the Dallas user group. Uh, thank you for having myself. My name is Wakaz Nazir. I'm the founder and CEO of DigitSec. Um, and we are a company dedicated to enabling developers uh, write secure code for Salesforce. Um, and Paul invited us to talk about one security tip that we can share on an ongoing basis. So today uh, I'll be talking to you about um, how to avoid cross-site request forgery in Salesforce. Um, and we'll give you some like tips on uh, sample code um, that you can quickly use to look at yourself uh, and also how to go about fixing it. So if we go to the next slide, I can give you a little bit of a primer on what this attack really means. So you must have noticed all of us, you know, use browsers pretty consistently uh, throughout um, the day. So once you authenticate to a website, unless you log out, um, the browser saves the session information. So that's your you know, cookies and other stuff that goes along with your session. Um, and when you, even if you close out a tab and even if you close out a browser, um, you reopen the browser, unless it was like an incognito or something, you can just go to the same website, whether that's a banking website or Salesforce or what have you. Um, if the browser has the session information available, it'll just send the session information to that website and you don't have to authenticate again. So that's by design, it's, it's not um, a security flaw to do that, that's just for usability purposes. The security flaw comes about because if the user, which is authenticated, for example, on a banking site, uh, goes to another site, uh, that's the browser um, that's loaded by that site can then send a request to the banking site and then the browser will happily attach the session information uh, to that request. And if the original banking site did not validate the fact that it was coming from another browser session, um, that request will get processed. Um, this is not a hypothetical you know, bug. There was uh, a few years back an issue with a financial company um, um, which basically allowed uh, folks to on, uh, on the back end, forge requests on a user's behalf by tra and transferring money. So all they had to do was uh, provide an account number and an amount. Um, and if the user was authenticated on the back bank site, um, the amount was transferred to uh, that uh, particular uh, account. So as a general best practice, as a user, it's always a good idea to always you know sign out of stuff that you're you don't um, um, need to be on, um, but the, the actual um, bug lies with the, the banking application, which was exploited. It was not an issue with you as a user or the browser. So when it comes to Salesforce, um, this is manifested in um, one key way, which is DML statements. So this is your create, update, and delete. So within Salesforce, if you are doing any of these actions within initialization uh, of a um, class, uh, for example, uh, first one is within a, an, a, an Aura component, there's an update happening on a component, which is part of the initialization um, work. So that's basically the same attack that is happening, cross-site request forgery. 
But if it was to be happening in a callback, such as a such as a click event, then that would uh, not be exploitable. Similarly, the second example in a visual force page, which basically takes um, an ID parameter in the initialization um, method and then deletes an account object. So you can see like how somebody can just create a bunch of get requests to this page with all the IDs and basically wipe out all data. So how do you do this correctly for a visual force page is to always do a callback. For example, in the third example, there is a callback, um, an Apex command um, that is doing a callback. So the Salesforce framework attaches the necessary information so the request is not forged. So that's a, a quick tip uh, on making sure that your code is not uh, vulnerable to cross site press forgery. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Wakaz's country, just to, to plug Wakaz's group, his company Digisec uh, actually writes a piece of software that will go in and scan your org for vulnerabilities like this. Um, it's, it's how they make their living. So the more bad code you write, the better off they are. Uh, will cause every time, they, uh, every time they find a new vulnerability or something's been exploited, they add it into their product. And will cause has been nice enough to agree to come help and tell us about it so that we can be more secure coders uh, and keep the, and put the, uh, the hackers out of business. So thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, Paul, for inviting us. A pleasure. Yeah, pleasure That's to see great. everybody again. Thank you. All right, Nathan, are you back from making your lunch? You want to give us an yep. update on the JS1 certification study course? Yeah, um, I don't have any updates. We don't have another course yet. Um, I think we may want to do this VS Code presentation first um, and either during a meeting or on a Saturday. But I will tell you that um, there is interest in a, in a JS1 certification group. And I, I think I have about four or five people interested. And um, I have offered to stop by if, if anyone wants to like drill down into a topic. And I'm sending an email out to everyone so far tomorrow. So if you're interested, send a chat or something yeah okay. send a chat or I'll, I'll put my email there if you want to email me okay yeah throw that in the chat That'd here be you great. go that's that's all i got all right all right so just a reminder we i, I did open up the uh, the zoom chat at 5 45 uh that's when we had a polyglot meeting between me and aicha um but it's open there if you want to just hang out uh visit and then we uh chat visit until we uh, start the session at 6.30. So, Ame, you want to give us an update on the UTD membership? Yes. So this uh, program, I think we would need to push it to the fall semester. Hopefully we'll have more user base and, you know, more students coming up uh, for the fall semester. So we do have this form open. If you're interested to be, being a mentor, please go ahead and sign up there. Uh, this is going to be just one off of a class, maybe one of the Saturdays we will blo block time for about two hours and then students will ask the questions about, you know, hey, give me an overview of Salesforce. What is a Salesforce? So how do you spell it? Uh, from there to, hey, I, I want to know something about Lightning Component. I want to know how, how to bubble an event, that level of uh, detail. So these four categories have been we, I mean, identified based on a survey that, that we ran. So topics are going to be around one of those categories. So if you are interested, just go ahead and sign up. You can, you can sign, uh, you know, scan that QR code and get to that form really quickly. If you, you know, come across any of the, any kind of issues, just do, do let me know. Okay. All right, Eric, you are up, sir. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to come and speak to us. Uh, I know you have been, I'll let you give a brief introduction of who you are, please. I, I, have known and been writing your coattails for far too long. Uh, how many, what are you a 13 year Microsoft MVP now writing code in Salesforce? And you're muted, sir. Sorry about that. I believe I'm on my 15th year, I think. Okay. Uh, somewhere around there, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, here. Uh, yeah, so it's been a while. Um, 
uh, a hot minute or two, at least, that I've been around the Microsoft space. Uh, my background is primarily around development. I've been a developer since I was a wee lad. Uh, been doing SharePoint for over 20 years, as scary as that sounds. Uh, and along the way, of course, a lot of generic .NET and SQL and all the other things that go along uh, with that. The last few years, of course, like a lot of other people, I've been doing a, a ton of Azure work. Don't actually do that much SharePoint anymore. It's mostly Azure and cloud-based uh, work. Uh, and I went ahead and put up on here all the different ways folks can get a hold of me if they'd like to reach out and, and touch base. The sort of the backstory here is that Paul and I used to run the DFW SharePoint user group together and did so for many years, uh, which we don't do anymore. Uh, but we had a really good run at it. Uh, and I also speak at Microsoft conferences around the world and have offices over in the UK. And uh, so I do in normal years, quite a bit of globe trotting. Um, and the, I, my exposure to the Salesforce ecosystem has primarily been through Paul. So if we're going to blame anybody for all this, it's probably his fault uh, more than anybody else. But uh, several years ago, we got pretty heavy into the business process automation space. And we're an Intex partner and uh, do quite a bit of work with that. And of course, Microsoft has their own automation platform now. And so we've been doing quite a bit in that area. And the genesis for... Uh, what we're going to talk about this evening actually came from working with a customer who was heavy into Nintex and Salesforce. Um, and their challenges and struggles uh, led to us creating this product. And then it was actually a conversation over Mexican food uh, with Mr. McCollum himself that led to us entering into the SharePoint space because he wouldn't, or the uh, Salesforce space, because he wouldn't quit telling us how awesome Salesforce was. Um, and so he sold me and, uh, and I jumped in. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, that journey, how we got to where we are. But I want to preface this by saying that everybody on this call and, and who's going to watch, subsequently be watching it knows more about Salesforce than I do. Uh, my knowledge is extremely minimal. Couldn't put it in a thimble, I don't think. Uh, and I've learned it all over the last year. Uh, as I've been investigating this space. So some of what I'm going to say is going to be self-evident to a lot of you. Uh, some of the things you may cringe a little when you look at our code and think, well, there's a better way to, to do that. You could do this or, or do that. And I'm certainly guilty of having done that over the years in the SharePoint um, space where I had a lot more um, knowledge and experience. Um, but I tried to pick up as much as I could along the way, and I bent Paul's ear a lot in, in trying to direct me down the right path and not making too many egregious mistakes. I'm sure we've made a few, but part of that has been learning uh, what we can and can't or should and shouldn't do, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned um, along the way. Uh, and so this is a bit of an agenda here we'll cover. I want to background it a little bit so people will understand where we're coming from and why we chose the path that we chose. Uh, then we'll get into looking at the actual code of what we built and then finally how we deployed it and went through the whole app exchange process and everything that's involved with that. And I encourage, um, if you have questions, go ahead and pop them into the Q&A. Um, I'm keeping an eye on that. I'll try and take some pauses to answer those questions, or if you want to save them all up to the end, I'm happy to do that as well. So feel free to um, intercede as you see fit. But let's background this a little bit with how we got here. So our primary focus at Aptogen um, is to build products primarily for other partners. So there's a number of products out there uh, that we built that other people market under their own brands from the training space to the higher ed space. Uh, Power Tools is our first product that we've released under the Agent brand that we're actually promoting and, and marketing ourselves. Uh, and the concept is pretty simple. We identified some gaps in some of the automation platforms, uh, primarily Nintex, the Microsoft Power Platform, IBM BPM, uh, and a few others, uh, where the out-of-the-box functionality had a lot to be desired uh, in terms of things that people could do. Like all, uh, there were a lot of Lincoln logs that came out of the um, barrel, uh, which is dating me for people who get the Lincoln logs reference. Right? The young folks are going, "What's a Lincoln log?" <laughs> um, the but 
as we all know, there's a lot more things that you often want to do that typically leads you to writing your own custom code or having to go out and cobble together a bunch of different solutions to die and bring it together. So what we created was a set of REST APIs uh, that perform a bunch of utility functions. And this is our starting point for branching out into other things um, as we go along, but this is really the core of what we do. Uh, it's a, uh, we live directly in the API economy. Uh, it's all subscription-based SaaS delivery. I'll show you some architecture components a little later about how that is put together, uh, but it's designed to be a no-code implementation. Uh, we do cater to the development community. If you wanted to use our APIs in any custom application stack you're building, or for example, you're building um, you know, a lightning component, you need the ability to do real-time currency conversion, uh, and you didn't want to write that yourself, and you just wanted to plug in, you could use our, our APIs. But our, our primary narrative story is around uh, low-code, no-code. Uh, platforms and empowering the citizen developer uh, to build applications that they are putting together without a strong development background or really any development background. And that encompasses a number of different workloads. Uh, the top three there are really our primary focus, but it also drops down to people like workflow architects and and people who own business applications that they're building in the organization and those sort of accidental administrators who get handed off these things to go create a, a business solution using the tools that they have really without writing any custom code. And what we discovered is there's a big disconnect from what we as developers think is code and what all of the people who fill these roles on the screen think is code. We don't think, for example, of putting in a date format string as code. Uh, we don't think of doing array operations as code. But to a non-developer, that's very much code. It's real easy for a low-code platform to say, oh, just write this expression um, or, or shell out and do this a little bit here. But to uh, Jane over in accounting who's been... Uh, lumped with building a process uh, in her department to satisfy some business requirement. Anything that looks like semicolons and, and um, dashes and symbols is code to her. And so we really had to think about our, our message and who we were targeting when we built this to de-developer it as much as possible and make our utilities as user-friendly as we could. With the primary focus around being, this is just drag and drop. You should be able to look at the UI on whatever platform you are, whether it's Power Platform and Power Automate, or it's a Salesforce Flow, or if it's a business automation workflow in IBM, whatever you're looking at, you should be able to drag and drop components and put it together. And my uh, sort of design thinking around this was to make it like kids development tools. So if anybody here who has young kids that you've been trying to get into um, code, there's a bunch of great tools out there where kids can learn how to code. And most of them use a puzzle metaphor of being able to put things together visually and, and build these puzzles or a, or a Lego kind of concept, uh, being able to plug things together. Um, in order to visually produce a, a program. And we're trying to take a similar approach in our, our target audience of making this as friendly as, as possible. So we've narrowed down our stack to, to be the least amount of work as possible for the end user. Um, and that means we focus on things that are utilitarian, um, you know, can, managing uh, string transformations or doing things like speech to text and, and translation or generating QR codes and passwords and, and those sorts of, of things that you need in your toolbox um, to get the work done and making it easy for users to, to plug that into their platform. Whereas in many cases, this is a coding exercise on a lot of platforms and, and still is to a certain degree. We built everything around the custom action concept. So we want it to be pluggable. When you go into Flow 
to build out a new process, you should be able to go right over to the actions, look in your Apex actions, find power tools and look through a list of all the components that we have. They should be self-descriptive. You should be able to drop them into your screens and have predefined pick lists where, for example, if we're if you're using our currency conversion component that we give you a list of all the currency pairs that are available to convert or if we're doing a, a scientific uh, calculation or, or a weights and measures conversion, you should have all those components predefined for you so that you don't have to go to the documentation um, to look them up. We have all that documentation. We have a full open API swagger doc uh, and test bed platform that anybody can use. We'll talk a little bit more about that later as well, but we want to make this simple. It also needs to be secure. Um, so that we satisfy the requirements that Salesforce has for their platform of using things like name credentials and OAuth and, and whatnot um, to connect with external uh, third-party utilities. Um, and it has to plug into the existing framework. Uh, this is really important for us. It means that it has to be in Salesforce parlance, has to be lightning ready. Although we're not building any UI components, we want it to be just drag and drop with whatever's there. You shouldn't have to do something unusual just to take advantage of our tools. It should fit in your normal work process. So that's what we have. And when we came to the Salesforce platform after finally being convinced that this was a way we needed to go, and we did our research and realized, you know what, there is something here. They have a mature process automation component. They have a store uh, that you can put components in. They have an extensibility story that allows third-party ISVs to plug into the platform um, and to get uh, exposure to the customer base. All the pieces are there. It's a big market. They do a lot of volume. We had no concept how big the app exchange market was and how much volume gets pushed through there and how many apps um, are out there, which uh, doesn't sound maybe like a lot. And these numbers are a bit old. I know it's more than 3,000 apps. Uh, now that's the latest hard information I could find. That doesn't sound like a lot to maybe someone who's used to building mobile iOS solutions and going to the app store, but from a business store for business users that we know are spending tens of thousands of dollars or more on plug-in solutions, that's a lot. That's a very mature offering and exactly what we were looking for. Their revenue sharing model is ideal. It's actually lower than what other platforms are taking. Depends on your solution. Uh, th this is all gets negotiated between you and Salesforce, um, as we learned, but uh, on average, that's about what you're looking at, which is very advantageous. Um, and we, because we were already coming from other platforms, we had all the pieces in place. We knew what we were looking for. We knew we wanted something like the app exchange. We knew it needed to be extensible. We knew it needed to have support, um, you know, the Dragon drop plug-in model and have all these bits and pieces there. We wanted it to support open API and REST because we didn't want to have to build separate backends uh, for each platform that we wanted to be on. Um, and it had to have relatively easy integration. So we maybe had a little bit of a uh, leg up, if you will, because we were coming off platforms where we'd already built all these things out. So those parts of the backend weren't a learning experience for us. However, it also meant that we were making certain assumptions because we came off of other platforms that we had built solutions for. We kind of thought we knew what to expect when we came to Salesforce. We were expecting the ability to support custom external connectors and being able to just ingest um, an open API spec with some possible modifications to suit the platform. But we expected just this external um, import. We expected to be able to brand that in a way that, that made our, our brand stick with the user that was recognizable. Uh, we expected to be able to build re a release managed package that we could version, uh, that there would be some sort of review and testing process by the vendor, uh, possibly a, a, you know some done by us, some, some done by the platform, um, and that we wouldn't have to create a lot of custom code to run on the platform. 
We also expected the implementation to be pretty much user plug and play. Like they should be able to go to the store, find what they're after, maybe do a search by the type of activity that they're looking for, find our solution, install it into their environment, possibly with maybe a little bit of, of administrator assistance, but mostly not, mostly be hands-off, uh, be able to, to come to our app and get their API key and, and sign up and, and be ready to work in you know mere minutes or at the worst mere hours. Uh, and that the, the store would give us a, a, a ability to hang out a shingle, if you will, in this environment and provide discoverability and be able to search for components and find them and, and see in context some, maybe some screenshots and some walkthroughs and, and whatnot. What we didn't want to have happen is bouncing back and forth between the platform you're used to working in and our website and um, uh, taking you out of context because we know from experience when you take people out of context, your ability to capture that, that buy motion goes down um, exponentially. Um, so these are the things that we kind of expected when we came to the platform and that initial due diligence said, yeah, we think most of these things are in place. And then of course we learned that not all of our assumptions were correct. Uh, that Salesforce operates a little bit differently uh, from what we were expecting, uh, which I'm sure folks coming off the Salesforce platform to something like Microsoft would say, well, that's a little bit different than we were expecting. Uh, so some of our assumptions were off base um, and, and some of them were a bit confusing, uh, starting with the ability to ingest external services. Uh, so. Salesforce supports this. There's a way that you can go in and add an external service to your Salesforce instance. Okay, you can put in a, a REST um, API uh, defined by a Swagger spec, perfect. But for some odd reason, Salesforce limits that specification to 100,000 characters. I don't know why, it seems to be some arbitrary limitation. I've yet to run across another platform that does that, but nevertheless, that restriction is there. Well, that, gave us pause because as you'll see on the later slide, we have over 80 endpoint actions in our suite. Uh, that's over 5,000 lines in a YAML file or JSON in the Swagger spec. Uh, we couldn't do that. It's, it's uh, or I should say it's over 5,000 characters, uh, 500,000 characters. So there, there's a lot there. Um, and we couldn't fit it into that limitation. So we were gonna have to start breaking up pieces um, of our suite uh, in order to get it ingested via that method. Well, that didn't work for us. It's too much work for the user. It slows down the onboarding motion. Um, it creates friction and friction means leads to lost sales. Uh, and so we didn't wanna go down um, that route. We also realized that this method required heavy administrator intervention. Like the average user can't go in and just add an external service. It has to be an elevated user with the right permissions. Uh, you have to set up name credentials. You have to, to allow endpoint access, which is another level of our back that um, people would have to be authorized for. Um, and more importantly, and this was really the straw that broke the camel's back for us on the import method is it didn't support custom objects, meaning that some of our endpoints, like our translation endpoints and our currency conversion, have enums in the Swagger spec that are dozens of entries. And they have to be very specifically formatted. When you choose a voice for text to speech, we're passing that off to the Azure Cognitive Services on the back end. It has to be a specific string value that we're passing. Uh, and what we didn't want to do is drive users to heavy developer documentation to go look up what the right uh, key value pair um, should be for that. We, we want to make it a pick list. We want it to be easy that users just choose their option. And the lack of custom objects in the import meant that we weren't going to have that um, capability. So that meant that was off the table. Uh, next, we started looking at, okay, obviously we're going to have to write some custom code um, here. Um, and when I say that, understand that I'm saying, I'm making a decision that I'm going to have to write custom code and I've never even seen Apex. I have no idea how Apex functions. I've never fired up the CLI. I have no clue what SFDX does. 
right? Now I'm a developer. I know how to do all that uh, node programming and I know how to do, I'm a C-sharp guy by background and ASP.NET. So not completely clueless when it comes how to make these things work, but I didn't know anything about how to do it in the Salesforce environment. I never heard of a scratch org uh, or doing any of those things. So we were making a pretty heavyweight decision here to take um, uh, hundreds, thousands of, of uh, characters of a spec and turn it into um, code. That was gonna be no easy process. Uh, we also then investigated the, the packaging concept, which in the end, I've come to be a big fan of how Salesforce does this. But initially from the outside looking in, the whole managed versus unmanaged thing um, and how that packaging gets delivered and managed was extremely confusing. Um, and it gave us a lot of pause, like, do we really want to do this and go through um, this process? Um, the, the real hit below the belt there is the security review process, which if you haven't put anything in the app, uh, into app exchange before, this one is going to uh, uh, throw you for a loop. I'm going to talk about more of that a little later. I'm going to give you a teaser there and we're going to come loop back to it because it's a biggie. Uh, the implementation wasn't that uh, different really from what we expected. Okay, it's an admin install, but for a managed package, that's not a big deal. Uh, setting up name credentials, well... You got to do that all the time anyway. So that's just asking the um, admin to go in and set a username and password for you, or in our case, an API key. But we wanted to make sure that name credential got deployed with the package um, and that it wasn't something we were having to give people a long install document to have to, to walk through. Um, and seeing that the, the object integration in the UI was a little bit limited, but it, it wasn't that bad. So things started to get better once we got past that initial hump of, oh boy. We're gonna to have to write a lot of code in something we've never touched before. Um, and there's this different way of delivering it that we're used to. Um, th things started to sort of go um, uh, easier downhill from there. The marketing piece, we loved App Exchange. Uh, it's a very content rich storefront. You can put videos and screenshots and they give you quite a bit of real estate to describe your solution um, and whatnot. Uh, they can maybe do a better job with links and embedding some rich content, but overall pretty good. Discoverability is kind of so-so. You have to sort of know what you're searching for, um, searching for things that your app does versus the app of your name or the name of your app leads a lot to be um, desired. The visual branding pieces are, Meh, um, it's okay, uh, but we weren't that thrilled with what we were getting visually um, from it. But overall, that part of the learning experience uh, wasn't that bad. So here we were faced with this decision. Oh boy, we want to be in the Salesforce market. We see all the advantages. Boy, we're going to have to write a bunch of code um, to make this happen. So how are we going to do that? And what process are we going to go through? Well, let's start with how this works on the back end. So this is a simplified architecture diagram of, of uh, our offering and our service. Um, on the front end, obviously we're in, we're in App Exchange and Salesforce, bearing in mind that these are custom APAC objects that get delivered that you will use inside a flow or process uh, builder. So there's fortunately for us, no uh, UI components, no lightning UI stuff that we had to deal with, not a bunch of a, a, you know, ASP.NET type of stuff that we're um, writing and no controllers and all that sort of stuff. So our front end of this was easier than a lot of people might be dealing with coming into to Salesforce with an offering. Uh, from Salesforce, we go to IBM uh, API uh, uh, management, uh, which is a standalone um, solution from IBM that runs in the cloud and on-prem. We use the cloud version from IPM for a lot of reasons, primarily because API Connect offers integrated uh, monetization, which a lot of platforms do not do. Uh, and then everything from a from IBM to the back end is all Azure. Uh, so everything runs as an Azure function, uh, security on the front end, the Azure front door and web application firewalls, uh, right? We have some back end third party APIs that we also um, rely on in addition to our native code uh, that we use. Everything is serverless and database -less. There's no data retention at all whatsoever. Uh, to what we do, um, and then our whole development stack from the from the back end because it's Azure Functions goes through Azure DevOps and whatnot. So it's all very cloud native um, type of stuff with a lot of cloud architecture behind the scenes on a multi cloud vendor platform, um, and that's running REST APIs at scale for multiple platforms is a lot harder than we thought it would be. And this comes from, I have a pretty solid Azure background. I've been doing it for a long time. 
Uh, and I, even I was surprised at the amount of moving pieces that have to be in place to do this stuff at scale. Um, it's a lot. So as big a fan as I am of the API economy and, and APIing everything, um, it, there's a lot of work to be done here if you're going to do this right properly at production um, scale. Just not as easy as it looks. But bear in mind that that's all behind the scenes. Um, that's what's happening before we even get to the point of, okay, we now have to write code for Salesforce. And obviously that meant we were going to have to write Apex um, code. Um, and okay, so I had to go do some learning about Apex and, and whatnot and you know node stack stuff that I already kind of knew. And so it wasn't that, that hard. But I've got a massive API um, with 5,000 lines in, in my def and, and counting um, and uh, almost 150,000 characters describing this API. Writing that from hand, by hand in Apex could take me a long time. Uh, I'd like to rapidly iterate this. How do I do it? Well, there's tools out there that will help you do those conversions and, and Swagger has one, um, uh, or I should say Smart Bear offers one through their um, Swagger uh, sort of branded platform called Swagger Code Gen, uh, that you can run and iterate over your API to generate classes for C Sharp and, and Node and Apex being one of them that they will generate. Well, cool, that's awesome. This should give us a head start. Um, it, incidentally, we also have a GitHub repo where we publish uh, uh, clients for our stack. We use the Open API generator for that as opposed to the Swagger Code Gen. Um, to generate those classes. It was a little better at some of the Ruby and Python and some of the off ones uh, that the Swagger code gen didn't cover quite as well. But here again, expectations met reality because my expectation was, and I've written code generators in the past, my expectation was I was going to get a compilable solution from that generation. I didn't expect it to be 100%, but I expected it to be, I don't know, 80%, 85%, um, give me something that I can deploy and test in uh, my environment because I'm still in the sort of POC phase. I don't know if this is gonna work or not. At this stage, I have yet to write a custom flow. I have yet to have a component I can test inside of a flow. So I'm doing all this analysis work and, and what up front before I ever get to a stage where I can say, is this even gonna work? Um, so from risk reward, there was a lot of risk um, inherently up front in doing this. And what we learned was those tools don't generate compilable code. Uh, they, they give you a good head start, and I'm still glad we did it that way. Uh, but the end result was less than we expected. I still spent several months writing custom code. And part of that was my lack of understanding of uh, the Salesforce development environment and the CLI tools, right? I didn't realize I was, this wasn't going to create a, a force project for me, that I was going to have to go and create a project with certain parameters first and then copy all this stuff into it. I expected it to kind of do it for me. Well, it doesn't. Um, it also doesn't create the custom objects that we need in the um, environment to expose our, our pick lists, uh, which was um, not trivial for us to do. So there was quite a bit there. In terms of packaging, that wasn't quite so bad because when you SFDX a new project and, and create it up, it scaffolds that for you um, to have most of the things in place to build a package, which I'm sure all of you already know, but was new um, to us. So I was pleasantly surprised um, at that bit. There's a bit we had to do to figure out what's a scratch org and how do I create one and why do I have to push code and it only lasts for a few days. And so that was a big learning curve to try and figure that a bit out. But once we got into a rhythm of, okay, we, we can now generate some code. Um, I can generate a package. How do I version it? Oh, okay. Now I see how I'm going to version that. And how do I, the whole testing thing, the limitation around the 75% code coverage and, and whatnot, a little bit new to us, but fortunately the uh, code gen created base tests for us. So I was able to go from that into um, finalizing out the test cases. It fell down in some areas of back-end communication and handling HTTP responses and stuff like that. But for the most part, um, I'm still glad we did it that way. 
uh, but I don't know if I was doing a, a force project from the ground up, if I would look at code generation, maybe. It was an option for us coming from a REST API, but maybe not the best overall. So let's look at the code that we did um, build. So I'm gonna switch over here into uh, VS Code and we'll look at our uh, solution. This should be pretty familiar to all of you who have done these things uh, before. Our solution structure involved us creating a base set of API components. What we've done to make our APIs easier to navigate is we group them together using the open API uh, tags concept. And that's a great way for us to organize our operations together with 80 of those and growing will be over 100 uh, by the end of this year. It's important to put those together in a way that's manageable. So we created uh, API classes for each one of those that for our collection uh, operations here, our base operations um, for that. And I even left all the generator code um, intact here just so I could always go back and reference it and see this is what we created, which is what kind of came from the generator and what didn't. This was, like I said, these were a good start. They didn't include some of the things we needed, figuring how to map things like our API key um, took some, some work. Um, and But it gave us most of what we needed. So we created one for each and you can see that, that each one of our um, collections operations here has a matching component. And these map very well to our overall spec. So if we were to go into our uh, specification, for example, over in our um, page here. Uh, so this is our open API specification. This is running on the API, uh, the IBM APIC platform. A lot of you have probably seen REST APIs in, in the smart pair platform on, on swagger.io. Um, uh, uh, this is very similar defines our operations, our inputs and outputs and, and whatnot, uh, and, and is all testable here. So from this, each one of these operations has a matching operation in our code. So we have, you know, here's our contains number um, operation and the scaffolding uh, to make that happen. And from there, we go to build out our overall generic classes for handling the headers and the responses and doing our posts and, and mapping those to the objects that we get back and the generic, I guess, utility stuff uh, that's happening behind the, the scenes. And so we group, we have the, the client piece uh, and then the mocking, of course, to do our, our tests um, and whatnot. Pretty standard, straightforward. Um, stuff. Um, object for our named credential. So we had to figure out when we did the deployment. I'll talk more about metadata API in a minute, but we had to figure out how are we going to, when we deploy a package, get all of our assets that we need um, in there. And so we figure out how to do the name credential, um, uh, which unfortunately uses the username password methodology. Uh, a little confusing because that's not what you expect when you're doing API keys. Uh, you expect a header and a, and a key value, but it works the same way um, in the end. Uh, and so we just had to figure out how to go in and, and define it. I'm going to come back to the objects here in a minute. Part of what our specification does is we define a bunch of input objects, which are primarily JSON objects and outputs. So if we're expecting three parameters and it has these two are Boolean, the one is in string enum, those are all defined in the spec. Uh, and so we have input classes that match those. Um, and so what each of our parameters are, we have examples for each one of those. Um, so you know what it is, kind of have an idea of what should be the inputs uh, and outputs. And again, this, a lot of this was generated by the generator, thankfully. Uh, we had to go in and make some modifications here, but for the most part, did a lot of it for us. So you'll see we have quite a bit of those inputs and then as well our various outputs uh, that we're also uh, mapping things over to. So when we have a complex JSON object, for example, uh, that comes back with things like the state difference one here that has a lot of components to it, uh, we could set that up and also set up the mocks for our test cases uh, to run our, our test coverage gift. Obviously the tests, uh, I group these together into our categories. So they're a little bit easier for me to, to track through as I'm doing the code, but just standard tests. You all will be familiar with these. This is just so when you run the FDFX um, and do the push that it runs through all of your, your tests and make sure you have the proper code coverage uh, for everything. 
and then into the utilities to themselves. So in each one of these, I'll choose the text one uh, down here, we have the actual meat and potatoes. So we have our compare string uh, that's calling out to our other um, classes. Now, some of the things we had to figure out, like how are we going to show this to the user in a way that they, it's user friendly. Like it's not my input parameter isn't something developer-y, right? Like a, some camel cased thing that we're using um, in our API spec. It needs to be a little bit more user friendly and descriptive so they know what they're looking for. Uh, and more importantly, when they're going into the Apex in the flow designer, they can type in something like compare string and it does that auto filter so that it gives them one of the ones that they're looking for. Well, that led to us learning about invocable methods and how do we define invocable uh, methods? And then how do we describe categories? Uh, so that's why everything we built had to be global with these invocable methods um, uh, uh, declarations on them. Uh, and then, you know, making the, the methods themselves global. So all of these showed up in the right context inside of a managed package uh, that gets deployed to any tenant, not just our own. These were all learning curves for this. We knew nothing about how things get exposed in, in unmanaged in your own tenant versus managed that goes out to multiple tenants. No clue. Um, how all that worked or how these get uh, exposed. So there was a lot of trial and error once I got to the point where I could deploy these um, of figuring out what are the Salesforce constructs and how do these get exposed inside of Salesforce. And that led to some code refactoring. Okay, the initial one we did, that didn't work real great for some of the things we wanted to do. Let's now go back in and put all our invocable methods and make them all global instead of just public. Uh, get rid of some private declarations there that uh, we'll need to expose and, and whatnot. So that was a fair amount of work of churning through those and then going and writing tests to match uh, each one of those uh, actions that we built. And I had to do that for all, uh, there's 80 some odd uh, that we have exposed uh, now. And in addition, we had to answer the question of how are we gonna do these pick lists? How are we gonna expose this to uh, the user? Um, and I went for months with calling them dropdowns too. I had no clue that they were called pick lists inside of, of Salesforce. I had to figure that terminology out as well. Uh, how are we gonna expose this? Well, that led us to the metadata API um, and defining these UI components that are deployable with a package. See, it's one thing to deploy custom code objects, but we have to do them in a way uh, that is salesforce -y in the way that it wants them uh, delivered. So that led to, you know, obviously we're creating a bunch of objects and we're defining fields. And in these fields, I have to go through and build this XML representation of every field. And all of these had to be done by hand. None of these got auto uh, generated. So this was a, a process of going to our spec, bringing it in here, defining all of these um, values. I got really tempted at one point to write a script uh, that would do that. I actually have some sample code that I may come back and revisit one day to pull all that out and, and just generate the metadata um, API stuff for us because there's a lot of work. Uh, but doing it meant that I was learning it and figuring out how this stuff function and what is the metadata API and, and how is it used and how do we need to code these up and, and what how do I want to describe these things and why is it important that I pick the right type, of, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, a very big learning curve here, but in the end, it was a very valuable educational process. Now, some of the things that came out of it were a bit extraneous, like it generates all this documentation for us that doesn't get used anywhere. It's, it's part of the spec. You can see it if you go in and look at the custom objects in the Apex code, but they don't really help anybody. And you can see it on our website anyway, but it's there. Um, and it all got defined um, for us. Had to figure out our, our you know, packaging bit, what are our orgs and, uh, you know, how are we gonna define the config and all that sort of stuff um, that, that were, you know, are part and parcel for what you all do all the time, but, but that was uh, really new um, to us. And, you know, what's our scratch def gonna look like and um, all these new things that, that we didn't know anything about. And so at the end of the day, that produces the, the package that we then deploy into our dev instance. So at learning, okay, as you're testing and building, it goes into a scratch work. 
Um, and then those scratch orgs expire. I mentioned that earlier. And, and you have to go and renew those every, what is it, seven or 14 days, I forget, um, that these scratch orgs expire if you're not doing anything with them. Uh, and then I'm going to have to build my package. And then my package has to go through, I have to get all the tests, right? Make sure everything passed my code coverage. And I'm going to deploy that to my dev instance. What's a dev instance? And how do I log into one of those? Um, okay, I've got that. Now um, I'm going to deploy to my dev instance. And when I deploy to my dev instance, what am I going to get inside of that um, dev instance? Well, uh, I'm going to get something that's familiar to y'all, but not familiar to us, which is um, I'm, I'm going to have these custom objects uh, that I have um, over uh, here. And so I've got these Apex objects that are um, defined. And how are those going to look? And when they get deployed in the end here of all, all of our Apex classes and uh, the, that generate, define our pick list. Hey, Eric, can um, I stop get... you with a question really fast? Sure. So we had two. Um, one was asking if your tool works with dynamic CRM. Uh, that came in over the chat. Okay, what's the second one? Second one is, um, did you have any trouble um, setting up a hub, a dev hub or an ISV environment? Did you have uh, to do that? That is an excellent question. Someone who's been there and felt the pain. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so let me answer the first one. Uh, I'll answer them in order. Uh, Dynamic CRM now works uh, with all your forms being in Power Apps. Uh, and when we built our initial connector for the Power Platform, we, we targeted it for Power Apps and for Power Automate. So yes, uh, from that perspective, it does work with Dynamic CRM from any Power App. If you have Power Apps and uh, Power Tools installed in your instance as a custom connector, you can go to it and, and add things like currency conversion, translate, and all that, all the endpoints that we have. You can also, because Dynamics is now integrated with loosely integrated, I should say, with Power Automate in your Power Automate flows, which are so much better than the old workflow process that were in Dynamic CRM with some caveats. Um, you can use Power Tools there as well, plugging into your Power Automate. So yes, we are um, compatible with Dynamic CRM, but because Microsoft has shifted to the front end being in Power Apps, we didn't have to build anything special for Dynamic CRM. It just to borrow an overused phrase, it just works. Yep. Second question, DevHub. Boy, was that a learning experience for us. Um, we had no idea uh, what the requirements are uh, there. Um, and we did have to go get that set up. So when you're onboarding as a partner, there's a process that you have to go through. I'm going to talk about here in just a minute uh, about how we go through that uh, process. And, and part of that is requesting uh, credentials for your DevHub, which I saw and completely ignored. Um, because when you join as a partner, you get a partner instance. And I thought that's where we were going to do our stuff in our partner instance. What I didn't know is that a partner instance is a real actual production Salesforce instance that you put specific things into like the license management app um, and the uh, order provisioning a lot, but it's real Salesforce. You can run your business um, on it. The dev hub is where we have to manage our packages and they have to get connected at some point. You have to connect your dev hub mm -hmm. to your partner instance so that the license management app can see your packages. There's no way, there's not like a, a UI switch that you go to, oh, I'm gonna go to setup and find that, it's not there. You have to request it uh, via, you have to open a case and you have to request that the connection get made. Once the connection gets made, there's a couple of prerequisites you have to do in, your, in both environments and then bang, things light up and start working. So the dev hub was a learning experience for us um, and figuring out how to set that up and how to deploy packages there and how to manage packages um, there in the dev hub, um, also a learning curve uh, for us. So here's our, our installed packages here. Um, now I, I am running in my dev hub in a new version that hasn't been released to app exchange um, yet. And that's what the dev hub is for. And this is, I actually like this because it gives me a set aside environment that I can do my full integration testing on. The scratch orgs are great for unit testing and just, you know, does this work and kind of how does it look? But 
the dev hub is, is persistent and lets us do our integration testing and our release testing um, there. So I'm actually a big fan of how this works in the end, but it was very confusing in the beginning to figure out how to make that work. Great, thank All you. Right, so yeah. once, once we're here and we have the package deployed, we now can do things like design a flow. And in our flow, we can add um, actions, some of which are Apex um, action. And so, you know, you can just click here and say, I want to add an action in, in our new action. And um, we can go down and because um, we, you know, kind of finally figured out how all of this was going to work um, together, I, I learned that you can, by describing the category, I can do power tools actions and it, it, it will give me all the list of all, all of our actions that are available. And this comes from decorating our classes properly um, and learning how to make that work. Uh, the naming conventions are what they are with the whole doubles underscore thing and whatnot. You can't do a whole lot about that. Um, uh, maybe y'all know a trick to make that a little better, but it's, it's Apex at the end of the day. So it's going to give you Apex class names, but decorating them gave us what we wanted, which is a way to make it easier. So if a want, customer wants to do currency, they can do that type of head search, right? Um, so nice and simple. And in the configuration, uh, it meant that we have predefined fields. So here's our source currency, our target currency and the value um, that, that you're going to add here and what those are, where it's coming from. It's coming from a, a pick list. Um, and what is our output going to be? You, know, you can attach the, the output and say from uh, you know this action I'm going to pick up, like in my send email, I'm going to pick up the um, you know uh, result for, oh, that's over in an email template, something else I had to learn how to build. Um, uh, and, and how to set up variables and do all that stuff. Those are flow specific things. But primarily what we were after was this. We were after the ability in a screen to define those pick list values and give them a source so that when the user runs it, they're picking from something and they're not having to go look up the predefined stuff. Now, if you are, this is one of the, the sort of strange things that, that the platform does that um, I'm still not sure why, but uh, when you're in a flow and you're putting together an action, if you're not doing a screen, picking from a pick list value is a little weird. You have to define the, the uh, pick list choice sets first um, and sort of define what these, uh, how these resources are and how they um, function. Um, and you know how does this thing work um, that you're building? In Process Builder, it's a little bit different where it's actually easier to see your pick list values from a dropdown and pick them in Process Builder. It's just a slightly different way that Process Builder and, and Flow work. But because we, we knew on the front end we wanted to have pick list values, we ended up building them the right way so that they worked in both. Um, environments. Took a little bit of tweaking to figure out how to get it just right, but in the end, <coughs> it worked out the way that we wanted. So that the users have drag and drop capability, they just bring them in, they configure them, they map things from their screens or their forms that are coming in to say if they're in a process. Um, and although it's not perfect, we'd love to see a little bit better UI capabilities here in, in Flow when you're building out the Flow um, uh, to be what we would expect to be a little bit more user friendly, but the Salesforce um, knowledge workers that we've interfaced with and we've been doing demos and whatnot have picked up on this pretty quick. So what seemed to be confusing for us apparently is a pretty native Salesforce motion. So people are used to um, doing that. So it wasn't as big of a deal as we thought maybe it would be um, in the end. Now. One thing I, I didn't, I don't have a slide for, but the whole debug thing, wow, that was new. Um, figuring out how to go and running from debug here is not enough when you're calling an external service. So while I can run in debug and I can go through this process of, of taking my um, screen and, and running through it and saying, oh, here's my input value and here's my pick lists, right? And I'm going to convert US dollars to, uh, you know, uh, Canadian currency bang and I'm going to go uh, next and run through my flow and I'm going to get an output and it's going to tell me what it did right and show me the result great that's cool but when something goes wrong um, this is totally insufficient I had to learn 
what is the debug panel? How, where do we even go? And that's part of setting up the dev hub, right? Is setting up your debug piece so that you can do the debug trace and that whole developer console our debug console that you can use um, and where you you watch in real time all the, the uh, requests and responses that are coming through. Uh, uh, an absolutely fabulous tool. Um, really wish I had this from some of the other platforms uh, we work on, <coughs> Microsoft. Uh, and, and it gave us visibility on the back end that we, we wouldn't otherwise have had. So I'm actually really thankful for that whole debug thing. And I remember even calling Paul and asking like, how, how do I do this? How does this work? Talk me through this thing um, and how it functions. And, and in the end, a great tool uh, and a great capability that helped us figure out um, the, uh, because stuff isn't running native code, it's calling an external service. So is the problem in the authorization? Is it in the, the request and response? Is it in what my Apex classes are doing? We had to figure that out. In the end, it was in my Apex classes and it actually ended up being the Apex classes talking to my REST APIs um, and the exact JSON that was getting exchanged um, that I had to narrow down to, but um, a, a part of the iterative process. Uh, so we talked about the, the custom objects and why we needed those and needed them deployed. And I just shows you the example of, of why we wanted to do that. It was really important to us and a great learning um, experience. Uh, packaging, a new thing for us, didn't know how this worked. Um, had to learn why you want to do managed packages if you're an ISV in our scenario versus unmanaged packages, which you might build if you're just doing your own stuff. Going into App Exchange, um, it pretty much requires that you do a managed package for the most part. Um, learning how to do the tests and, and whatnot and make that work um, together uh, was really a matter of just putting the pieces together. It, packaging wasn't hard once we learned what we needed to do, and then we learned how to create and manage them in, in F SFDX in the command line. Uh, but just sort of getting that mental picture of how it all put together so it could be deployable in the store um, took a bit of effort um, for us. Now, uh, onboarding or, or execution, how do we go from, okay, I wrote the code. Now, how am I going to get this code into the app exchange? I've got my package, tested it, my dev instance, everything was working. How do we make this stuff happen? Well, this is not a simple process. Getting from, hey, I'm a developer with an idea to in the app exchange is purposely difficult. And, and it's Salesforce creating a gate, uh, several gates actually, to ensure the integrity of the app exchange. And it's, it's not to keep the little guy out, although they're pricing on it could make you question that. It's to make sure that you've done the proper due diligence and have everything in place so that when you put something in Salesforce that customers have a high degree of competence in what you built and that it meets the Salesforce standards. And it starts with, you better be a real company. Uh, you, you need to have a business plan you need to be able, you need to have information security policies that are documented to meet modern standards. You need to be able to answer. I even had to submit financials um, for the business, which seemed exceptionally odd to me. But it's there, in the end, it turns out they're not looking for how much money you do or don't make. They're looking for, can you produce artifacts, documentation like a real business would? Can you produce a PL? Can you produce a balance sheet? Can you produce InfoSec documents like I already mentioned? Can you produce formation documents, right? And so it's a vetting process. Um, and part of that process is you have to define a business plan. You need to know what it is you want to do with this thing that you're building. You need to know who your target audience is. Um, and it's easy to say, oh, well, my target audience is Salesforce, but it's not. It's, as we learned, it's specific subsets of users or segmentation, especially as Salesforce keeps growing their platform with all these other capabilities. Um, knowing who your target audience is and which one of the Salesforce clouds you're going into is really, really important. Um, if you're building a template, for example, that's gonna spin up an entirely new instance, maybe you're onboarding customers. 
for Salesforce or doing something really custom, you have to really think that process out. Know what your pricing is going to be. Know how much you're going to have to spend marketing this to Salesforce users and what percentage Salesforce is going to take and how you're going to manage the order entry um, piece. Uh, the the back end, in my opinion, still has a lot of gaps. There's some very distinct automation pieces missing from order management, which you would think Salesforce being a CRM platform, they would have solved that, but they haven't. Um, there, there's automated provisioning has some gaps, uh, big gaps. Did you see, Eric, um, the University of, I believe it was Minnesota, got in some trouble with the Linux Foundation. There were some researchers there that had fancied themselves security researchers and they decided and they published that they were publishing a paper on Twitter. They announced that they were publishing a paper on stealthily introduced, um, uh, what was it? Exploitable pieces of code into the Linux kernel. And they published that article, that article got around and the Linux foundation found out about it. They had not been notified that this was going on and they kind of shut down the uh, University of Minnesota's accounts. They found these people, they issued something, but the researchers hadn't kept track of where they had submitted exploitable code very well. So there's now a massive reversion activity and uh, not lawsuit, but the, the, the university is getting put under a magnifying glass and said, you can't participate until you get these yahoos that decided they were going to test our processes, which is basically person reviews of code. That every time they were submitting a, a new a new put, they were having to, uh, you know, people volunteers were having to review this code. So they exploited what they knew was a human run position to put out a paper saying this process is exploitable, <laughs> uh, but didn't bother to do it under the guise of any kind of gray hat or, or, or negotiation there. They just decided to do it. And they kept such bad records that they're now having to try and track back and see how far um, and which ones might possibly be bad things and what was built on top of that. So it is a massive foobar situation from the, the lack of, of gates um, that these guys went or don't have in this public. Well, and thing. I think I think that um, to, to your point, why Salesforce puts some of these hurdles in place. And and initially, I was very off put by these hurdles. But as I thought it through, and and let me tell you something that I was uh, I have been exceptionally overjoyed. Um, those are two strong adjectives put together, right? Uh, with is the partner engagement team. They have been phenomenal um, at Salesforce. They, from the word go, reached out, scheduled conversations. Um, they're always available for consultation. Um, and, and we were able to ask all our questions. But more importantly, they were able to explain why they were asking for the information they were asking for and what they were going to do with it and how it was going to be used. Uh, and it's been a really great process of working with the partner engagement um, team. Now, they don't have all the answers, especially not technical questions. I had a mountain of technical questions that they couldn't answer. And we eventually had to get some technical people uh, to try and answer um, those. Uh, but from the beginning to, to follow up, they just followed up with me the other day on, on our order management stuff. They've been fantastic. Um, now, you're going to pay for that privilege. And I'm going to explain that in, in a minute as, as to how that works. But the, the process does exactly what it's meant to do to your very valid point is it puts proper gates in that they're vetting who's putting things into their store because if Salesforce were to release a plugin for their platform, this is sensitive financial information, right? And, and lots of uh, PII involved in most Salesforce implementations. Uh, they're, up, they're in big trouble. And, and it could scupper the platform. So I'm, I'm actually glad they did it the way they, they did it. I wish they would do it faster. Uh, but part of this process of once you get through the business plan and you've, you've answered all those questions and they've reviewed it and accepted you, you now have to go through a security review. Um, and the security review process um, is multifold. So first they're gonna vet are you doing something that's of value to the Salesforce platform? But then they're gonna vet your code and your implementation. Uh, and there's two pieces of this. One is the, the, 
very simple, just code analysis. There's a code analysis tool that it runs through that just looks at your Apex code and makes sure you're not doing anything silly in the Apex code, you know, automated stuff. That's easy. If you've written halfway decent code, you're gonna pass those tests. What's not so easy is the rest of the security review. So think back to my architecture diagram where I've got IBM APIC and there's a developer portal there that runs on Drupal um, for customers to sign up and get their API keys and whatnot. There's our website that runs on WordPress um, that thankfully is not part of our provisioning process. Um, but that has information on it. There's Azure behind the scenes, right? There's a lot of pieces to our solution. And we have to test all of that. And we have to provide test reports, penetration um, testing, and code vulnerability testing to the security review team. So uh, I, thankfully, we didn't have to do code review um, and testing to all the JavaScript stuff and whatnot for the front end, because we don't do any of that. So we didn't have to worry about some of the pieces that um, uh, Wakash was uh, looking at earlier uh, around you know, the JavaScript vulnerabilities and whatnot. We did, thankfully didn't have to go through that, but you might when you're building a solution, be prepared. All of that has to be tested. For any external components like your website, you're gonna have to run, pass and submit test from the OWASP ZAP scanner, uh, which you run against your, your target site. This was scary for us because we don't control when, when you sign up for these API management platforms, which are absolutely essential if you're running APIs at scale. Uh, you have to have one, whether it's uh, Amazon or Microsoft or IBM or, or any of the other providers that are out there um, for these um, API management platforms, you've got to have one. And we don't control that. They give us a Drupal instance and we don't control it and we can't replace it. It's part of the platform. I can't go update it. If there's a vulnerability in the Drupal version that they're using, I can't do anything about it. Um, but what I can do is go install plugins. And boy, have I had to install a lot of Drupal plugins that I never even thought um, that I would need. And a lot of that came from this, this Zap tool. Um, that runs against your, your site and looks for all these vulnerabilities. When you run this, you got to run it on a big machine that has a lot of resources. It takes hours and hours, if not days to run, if you have a relatively complex implementation um, and it chews up just, just gigs and gigs of memory and on disk. At one point it was up to 20 odd gig of memory on our machine running um, against our site. And it produces this report and the report uh, which I have an example of, um, looks like this. Uh, and it categorizes high, medium, low, and informational. Um, you have to resolve all of the highs on here. When we first ran it, it was a bunch. And I had to go in and find plugins for Drupal that would fix vulnerabilities and patch and this and that and the other. It was a lot of work. Uh, and if there's something that it produces a false positive, like this one does here for this path traversal problem, you have to go verify it manually. If it's a false positive, you have to create a document and you have to submit a document to the security review team um, it, it, for them to accept your exclusion uh, from that. You then have to explain the medium and lows. You don't have to ask for an exception. You just have to explain why they're there. And they're going to look at this. I learned from experience. They're going to look at every line of this report, and they're also going to run their own scan um, against your report. So be prepared for this process. It takes a while. Conduct your own penetration testing. Do as much as you possibly can on your own before you start the security review uh, process. And, and here's why. Here's why I put these as steps number one, two, and three. Test it. Harden it, go do everything you can to make these tests pat. Go do one through three over and over and over again until you can produce a clean report. Here's why. Because as soon as you go to submit that report, you're ponying up $2,700, period. End of, no negotiation unless you're a, a not-for-profit and then it's, or you're producing a free solution, in which case it doesn't cost anything. But if you're putting this on the app exchange to make money, you're writing Salesforce a check for $2,700 to con conduct the security review process on your application. Now that right there sets a bar that a lot of independent developers aren't going to be able to get over. Um, and each time, in my opinion, well, I'm going to talk about that. In okay, a sorry. 
Um, so each package that you submit has to go through this security review process. Now, if you are creating multiple packages as part of a single all up solution, right? Like you have a big solution that requires all these different packages. You can do that as one security review. But if you're obviously doing different products in the store, pretty much if each thing that you're submitting has a separate listing, it's 2,700 bucks a pop for you to submit them. So you got to come up with that money paid up front. And they tell you in advance, this could take weeks or months until you get a response from the team. So it goes into a queue. You have to open a ticket saying, I've submitted this. It then goes into a queue and you hear nothing for a period of time. Then they're going to come back to you and ask for credentials, right? Go set us up these credentials, go whitelist these IP addresses, um, and we're going to test against your, your dev home. Um, and then they're going to go away, and then they're going to come back. It took about seven weeks when we did it to go through this process end to end. Now, I got, I'm going to say lucky because we passed on the first try. But we only passed on the first try because we listened to our partner engagement team. I had people like Paul who hooked me up with people I could talk to that had been through this process uh, before that kind of gave me some pointers. And I spent a lot of time researching it. There's some very good information out there on Trailblazer about how to do this, how to go through it. There's office hours that you can go through um, and sit in and ask questions and listen. Um, and the partner engagement team will give you all of that. You get these long, lengthy emails with all these links and stuff. Take advantage of those resources. Part of the reason we got lucky, as it were, is because we didn't have to do the front end uh, lightning component UI stuff. So we, it was a little easier, I think, um, for us. But we did have to do all the back end testing, which some people may not have to do. What you don't want to do is test, submit they find vulnerabilities that you didn't find and you have to resubmit and wait another four to six weeks and another four to six weeks. You don't want to do that. So make sure that you have hardened this and gone through the testing to the best of your ability. You want a clean report before you pony up the dough and start waiting. Now, once you've gone through that process, at the same time, you will be building your app exchange um, listing. So from your partner portal, which you will also get as part of the process, this is where you will do your business plan and all that review and the, you'll initiate the security review and you have to answer a ton of questions in the security view um, and whatnot. You'll go through all of that and that's to create your actual app and produce your um, listing uh, in uh, App Exchange. Uh, so questions you have to answer here, whether you do trials, this and that and the other, which package you're producing. This is where you have to have the, the linkage between your dev hub and your partner org um, to make that uh, work and put that um, together. Um, and then you have the text and the media for the listing and app exchange. So this is a pre-formatted thing and you go through here and answer all these questions, put in your text, and then there's media here where you can upload screenshots and walkthroughs and videos and, and whatnot. Um, and all that sort of stuff is here and building out. This produces your app exchange listing. So you don't need to have this done before you submit your security review. Get your security review going because you know it's going to take weeks. So get that done and then come in and start building out your app exchange listing and get it just the way you want it so that it's ready when you get through the security review process. Now, once you've gone through security review, any time within a year that you update your package, it will get automatically approved. You, unfortunately, you still have to submit it and answer the same questions. And as I've discovered, much to my chagrin, it doesn't save your entries from your first submission. And I didn't save them as I was filling out the form. So now I have to go through and re-answer all those security review questions uh, from before because I've got a new update that I want to release. So word to the wise, don't do what I did. Copy down all of the, the answers to the questions in the security review, put them in a, a OneNote or wherever you keep your notes so you can come back and you don't have to go through that pain again. Uh, but you get automatic approval for up to a year. When you get to that one year point, when you resubmit after that, the fee drops down to, I think it's $150.
you still have to submit a, a report. So you have to do your tests. You have to resubmit the report, but you don't have to pay $2,700 every time. It's just upfront. Or there's some caveats in the language about if you make any really major changes or whatnot, you, and they requires extensive testing. So example, if we were to switch platforms from say IBM APIC to, to another platform and, and we had a different developer portal we would probably have to go through a more extensive security review. That may be negotiable. You may be able to talk to your partner onboarding team, but they're, they're pretty strong about saying this is mostly a one-time fee and don't expect to have to pay this every year. And you shouldn't really have to. Uh, the, the process though is the same. Build your package, release it, um, do your tests, go through security review, expect to get automatic approval under that year, expect to go through security review when you reach that year point, that's sort of a rolling year, a year over year thing. Once you are in release, you then have to learn partner orders and license management. This is manual. You have to go through a whole trailblazer course on learning the partner management app. You have to get it integrated into your portal. And all of this is so that you can provision licenses and you can create orders and then you, you create orders, submit them to Salesforce. And that's how they know um, how to get the, the, how much to charge you for your sharing fee and um, all that sort of stuff. So it's not difficult. It's, it's an admin task. It has to be done. You have to go through the trailblazer thing and, and do it, set aside some time for that. There's no charge for it or anything. It gets deployed into your uh, partner org. Um, and you can always go back and revisit the training and stuff to, to review. I mean, they actually did a walkthrough with us um, of people step by step of how it um, how it's done. So pretty straightforward, but something that you have to go through as part of the process. So just when you think you're done and you're ready to go, you got to go through the partner order um, process. Um, and so that's typical release management, you know, after that um, sort of stage, you can update your app exchange listing at any time, right? Um, and, and you can do promotions and, and whatnot. Price changes um, can be a little sensitive depending on what your pricing structure looks like, but they do have the capability to go in there and um, modify pricing tiers, but you have to do it through your partner engagement team. Marketing, final, final bit here. Um, if you expect that you will build it and they will come, you will probably be sorely mistaken unless you have the great widget ever built that everyone is looking for. Marketing's on you. You're gonna have to go out and market this just like you market everything else. So if you're running um, you know, text-based uh, Google search ads, SEO, do that. You need to make sure your website is, you know, has purchase funnels for, for bringing people into App Exchange. Um, if you purchase entirely, if they make their entire purchase through App Exchange, there is an order management system in App Exchange that if you can use it, I highly recommend that you do because it makes your life so much easier. It's called checkout. Um, and it's integrated with Stripe and it's super easy. We can't do that because our API management is, is on a separate platform. Um, so we have to do the manual order management. Uh, but that still doesn't help you actually get the customers. You're responsible for going and get the, the customers. Drive that search to your app exchange listing as much as, as you possibly can. If you could do a free trial, do it. They've now got this new um, free offering where you can provision environments um, for free trials um, and, and pre-populate them with data and, and set them up. I just learned about that the, the other day. Um, and so that's a great way that you can set up customers uh, for free. It's called Trial Force. Um, and then you can, if you build a free version, so let's say you want to do full freemium, not just um, here's a, a free trial. If you want to do freemium, which we do for Power Platform and we're considering doing for Salesforce, um, you can build a free app and you don't have to pay for security review on a free app. If it's free, they'll do it. I, there may be a minimal charge, I, I forget. Or if you're a nonprofit, um, you don't have to go through that. So if it's free and not generating revenue, really cheap to get it out there. So you can have a freemium version along with your full paid um, version. And that's certainly an option. It's worked very well for us on other platforms doing a free version of reduced um, capability set. And I think we're going to bring that to, to Salesforce because trial force, I don't know how well that's going to work for what it is that we're trying to do, but it might be very applicable 
um, to your solutions. So I know that was a lot. I know that we spent an hour um, or so here uh, going through that. Um, and I thank everybody for sticking with me. And, and now I'm happy to answer any questions. And, and Paul, flip it back to you. Eric, that was fantastic. That was a ton of information. I think that was about three hours worth of information in an hour. Uh, yeah, take a drink, take a <laughs> bow, man. You've got to be, <laughs> your talker's got to be worn out. Um, anybody have any other questions that they want to ask? I, I learned a lot. I wasn't expecting to learn a lot, Eric, but like, like Paul said, you really packed a ton of great information in there. So thank you. Um, I'm still processing it. I probably have some questions, but they're not on top of my head at the moment, but thank you. Uh, Paul, Paul, do you have a place to, I can send you the slides. You want me just to put it up to slide share and send you a link? Um, so that'd be great. Um, I, I'm starting okay. to put slide share and I think you're actually, this session's pushing me over the top. I just sent Ame a note. Uh, I've got to get a YouTube channel up. This is uh, priceless uh, for people that are, um, have, have an idea that they might want to do this. So I think this is going to be a kind of our, our beginning uh, <laughs> um, knowledge stone that we have out there, knowledge base that we start to build for our group. So um, I'm going to right, get Let this. me know what I can do to help. No, thank you. I've done more than enough as usual. Um, Nathan, did you have any questions? I, I don't know if uh, if any of this spoke to you any of his trials and tribulations with uh, uh, VS Code and the other plugins? Well, I, I, there was one thing that stood out because I was doing a little test trying to make a, one of the managed packages through SFDX and I noticed, what the tornado was? Well, oh well. Um, I noticed that it, it just didn't work when I put it in the other org, but but I saw that it looks like from what you did that I need to make everything global and not public and in, in my managed package. And, and that means everything, right? Like anything that must be accessible to a page or something like that, it has to be global, right? Like if I have, you know, three or enabled uh, calls that go to the client global. Yeah. Oh, and I, and so I had another question now that you're showing me your code, but. But that's my yeah, first so, question. So what, what we learned is you can, exp and I'm, I'm, I'm not an Apex expert, so I may be talking out of school here. So please mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong. But what I think we learned is um, in your managed package, if you want to expose the class, it needs to be global. If you want to expose methods within the class, those methods also have to be global. But there's a specific relationship around invocable methods um, and, and public or global that, that I wasn't really clear on in the documentation. And I initially started with public. It didn't quite work right. I went to global. But I, I believe the answer there was the, the packaging, as you have indicated, that it wasn't showing up for me because it wasn't global for the package. And I had the public declaration in the wrong place. So we okay. ended up going global all the way through worked for us. Maybe that's not the right approach, but it, it did get us where we wanted to be in the end. Okay. And then my next question is, how do you make those subfolders? Um, are those what you were saying were separate projects or how do you do that? Like breaking it out into utilities? Yeah, these are just, um, they're just subfolders on the file system. Um, so you could just add your own um, it folders and it'll or, pick it up. Yeah. So yeah. The, okay. the, the tricky bit is making sure that you have all your meta files where I can find them, right? I ended up, right. I've since learned that there's maybe a better way to do this, but <laughs> I didn't know that to begin with. So yeah. I created a meta for everyone, but okay. I think there's a better way of doing that. Okay. And then another thing is, how do you define exactly what's in the managed package? It's, it's anything in one scratch org or, or that's another thing that I'm, I don't get. I don't understand it. As far as what components go into the managed package? Right. Yeah, there is a, someone will probably beat me to the punch here, but there is a um, package here that tells you, I forget exactly where did this isn't it. It's somewhere else. It's it's in the somewhere here in the configuration. I apologize okay. for not knowing what it is off package the top of my head. Scratched F JSON. Right there. No, it's no? it's okay. 
somewhere in this definition somewhere, and, and someone's probably screaming out there that they know exactly where it is, um, you define exclusions and inclusions for your package okay. um, that are specifically for the managed package. Now, we're not talking build. Build is, is done by the package JSON and, and whatnot. That's all done here. Um, but there are, um, there are some capabilities here where you can do some exclusion as to what's get, what gets included um, and doesn't um, in, um, in the overall um, structure. So if there are objects that you want to exclude from that packaging, you can do so. And I, I apologize, I don't remember where that is off the top of my head, um, but it's in the configuration files. Okay, here. now that helps, thank you. Very yeah, Eric, we are, we are mostly career developers, like, you know, corporate devs here. We don't have a lot of entrepreneurs. I think Wakaz uh, and his team would be the closest thing to, um, you know, independent app developers that we have. And I, I know Nathan has, Nathan and I have been talking about this kind of stuff, and I know he's had some ideas. Nathan's working on writing a, a VS Code plugin for distribution. Um, but yeah, Lars, actually his company also, they've got I don't know if their product counts as a plugin or it's a standalone app, um, but yeah, no, you you're you're standing alone on having thought through all of this stuff. So, well, we, that's we to to um, uh, the earlier point about the package that we had to learn that um, managed packages don't mean they're deployable everywhere. Um, that that the, the mm -hmm. way you've defined your code determines whether it can be used in outside of your org um, or not. Um, wow. And so that was that whole global public thing uh, that we had to figure mm -hmm. out, okay, this will work. And going through the documentation, it's not always clear as an outsider to this, that I didn't grok a lot of the sales point, Salesforce lingo stuff around this. So I really had to read things three or four times to kind of figure out what it was we wanted to do. It's all there in the documentation. The documentation is fantastically thorough for the most part. It's there. It's just trying to figure it out coming from the outside in was a bit challenging, kind of like the SD, SFDX because some of the documentation is for earlier versions and you have to kind of figure out, oh, that's not how we do it anymore um, kind of thing. But uh, for, for the most part, it's all there. All right, well, we should probably awesome. cut this a little short with the uh, impending, we've got a tornado warning um, and serious thunderstorms heading within the next hour and a half. So. And if the sirens are already going off where you're at, Nathan, I want you to take cover. Yeah, I'm going to go figure out what's going on. Eric, but this has been so phenomenal, much. man. You did not disappoint. Thank you yeah. very much, sir. Well, thank you all for having me. I, I appreciate right. the opportunity. This was a new one for me, so a lot of fun. Very cool. Great stuff. All right, guys, we will talk to you next month, and we'll uh, be visiting with uh, Wakaz on, on secure coding. So. All right. Nice Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Thanks guys. Good. Thanks, Eric, for the prezo. Thanks for joining, Acha. From Morocco. <laughs>